So this episode was a little bit of a step down from last week's episode, but you know it is kind of hard to follow up such a devastating moment. By the way, all the guards finally decided to show up. Here they are. <laughs> this episode has to establish some of the other side characters, so it feels a little bit less focused. But you know, we're early on the season, so a little bit of downtime should be expected. This is a fascinating little scene here where basically Otto Hightower wants to take advantage of this incident of the slaughter of his grandson, put the blame on Rhaenyra as a political move to get support for the Greens, you know? People will support them if they think that Rhaenyra sent uh, an assassin to kill a baby. And so, yeah, they gotta have a performative funeral. Let's keep track of what Helena's doing. You know, every little thing could be a clue, could be some foreshadowing. For example, she reaches out to grab a little elephant here. He's literally grabbing the elephant in the room. The metaphorical elephant in this room is that Alicent was sleeping with Kristen Cole. That's going to come out to the open eventually. That's going to happen. And it seems like Helena is going to be the one to do it. And, and that probably will put Kristen Cole on Aegon's bad side, right? Because Aegon appointed him as the hand in this episode later on, right? So maybe that's what's going to happen. Maybe that's what's what we're foreshadowing here. I don't know. Anakin, you know, maybe there's going to be a big elephant that shows up later. Who knows? Anyone else scared that his head was going to fall off? You know, especially when they went over that pothole. Like, how good was that stitching, you know? I don't know. I thought they were going to do something morbid like that. But lucky the kid's head was intact for the funeral. But it's a well shot scene. This is how you use slow-mo effectively, I think. To get inside Helena's mindset as time kind of slows in this moment of grief. We get more scenes from the common folk, from the everyday folk in King's Landing. And how separate they are from the royals. Here's a great Renice moment, you know. She's just sitting there and tells this guy to, to mind himself. I like this fight between Rhaenyra and Daemon here. Not so much because I think the dialogue is amazing or anything. It's more so that it clearly establishes Damon's motivation and reasoning behind his actions, right? Damon feels like his brother put Rhaenyra on the throne because he feared that Damon would overshadow his legacy. Which is just like an egotistical uh, perspective from Damon, right? But the reality, I believe, is more with uh, Rhaenyra's perspective that her father didn't trust Damon. You know, just like she can't trust Damon right now. There's that mystery, right? We cut away before his response to Blood and Cheese when they asked what to do if they couldn't find Damon. And that seems to be a purposeful decision to keep the audience guessing whether or not Damon ordered a kill on a baby or not. And like Rhaenyra and everyone else, we have this, we have these doubts in our in our head now, like, oh, could he could he have been as evil as he seems to be? Maybe he's not that bad. He still seems to be distant from his daughters. He doesn't really acknowledge when Bela walks by. That's gonna, I imagine that's gonna come into play later. Again, lack of communication here. Aegon here can't bring himself to even speak with Helena at this point. Pretty shot of, of Rhaenyra here. I guess she feels a little bit isolated in her castle while Damon goes out to fight on the dragon. Maybe she's craving some more action. She's gonna get out there soonish. Kristen Cole is insecure about his position as leader of the White Cloaks. He commands Eric here to go and, and kill Rhaenyra, pretending to be his brother. It's a pretty silly plan, simplistic, the type of plan that a young bro king would think is really cool. But obviously he's trying to compensate for his incompetence by sending uh, someone else to do a fool's errand. So here we have a little crossbow scene. Is, is there some romance building up here? That'd be nice to see. Sir, I don't know, could it just be friendship? I mean, are they related? They're probably related, aren't they? I, I forgot. But this is uh, House of the Dragon, so they probably will hook up, you know. The first brothel scene of the season. The only moment Eamon shows her vulnerability here is when he's with a sex worker slash therapist. And often sex workers end up having to be therapists. For a tough man who can't be vulnerable outside the bed. Here we get one of the scenes of the regular folk of King. King's Landing 
This is the weaponsmith, right, who was uh, asking for the king to, to get some relief. Out of all the scenes of the common folk, I think it's probably the least interesting to me. I think more so this character is just not really doing it for me. Maybe focusing more on her would have been more interesting. I think she does a better job at, at conveying uh, the struggles of, of the poor folk. But overall, this scene kind of feels like out of place, like it feel, almost feels like another TV show. And, and of course, I do want to see more moments from, you know, the, the lower classes, the peasants, the, the common folk. But it has to also be integrated in, in a good way. I think it's better to focus on some characters we're already familiar with, like Masari, the White Worm, for example. You know, she has a connection more to the non-royals. Uh, maybe, maybe it would be better to focus on characters through her. This scene, though, I think does work fine. I, I'm liking these characters here. So, you know, it's a little bit hit or miss with these new characters so far. I don't know, it, 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 we're going to have to see how it plays out, you know. Looks like Renice and Corliss are happy. Seems to be the only happy couple right now. We get a little bit of respite here, though I imagine it's not going to last too long. Okay, so now we have Masaria come into the picture. I like this scene. I think it gives Masaria more depth. She's becoming a more interesting character in this season, I think. Here she's basically trying to get on Rhaenyra's good side and trying to appeal to Rhaenyra as a, as a woman in this world who hasn't been respected. It does work well enough because she does end up letting Masaria go later on. This is a great scene showing how Otto is so frustrated with this impetuous king. He throws away the goodwill they gathered by having that funeral. Now the family members of all these rat catchers are, are going to hate him. I guess Otto feels pretty confident in this scene to be so aggressive towards Aegon. Now that Aegon has his bloodthirst in him and realizes the, the immense power he has and the satisfaction he gets from enacting that power, he decides to give Chris and Cole the badge of the hand. Surely it's going to backfire on him. This vengeful Aegon, I think, wouldn't work for me if the performance here didn't have the range. If we didn't see Aegon in a more lighthearted mood last episode and then we do see him uh, show some more emotion later a different emotion not just uh, anger but it does seem a little bit archetypical to have this young king only out for revenge and not really being calculating or anything at all you know so masaria is released and just as she's getting to freedom she notices that the other l elric is coming in you know, and so presumably she tips somebody off she tips the other elric off that his twin brother is here to me, the scene seems to indicate that she's going to stay and, and become an ally to Rhaenyra. Maybe she feels like she has a better chance of, of living a better life here than starting a new one somewhere else. So this whole scenario is interesting, though I think it's not as well executed as it could be. Because it's at the end of the episode, again, it kind of mirrors infiltration from last episode. But this one doesn't feel as effective, doesn't feel as tense. Of course, it ends up with the, both of the Eriks fighting each other. Which in isolation is actually a pretty decent fight. And the performances are actually pretty good, especially like here. And it's intentionally confusing, you don't quite know who's who and they were seeding this moment throughout the series throughout season one the idea of these two twin brothers being on opposite sides so the pieces were set for a while there but i still don't think it had the impact it wanted to have i guess the subplot of the brothers kind of felt a little bit tacked on in the first season and maybe it could have been a little bit better integrated for this scene to land better it felt a bit like a hurried contrivance to add some action into this episode and then the moment he kills himself is also a little bit odd to me it's almost like this subplot was a burden they were holding or something and they had to just get rid of it right here right away and maybe this would have had even more impact if he stuck around and we didn't quite know which of the twins survived you know pretend to be the eric that supports rhaenyra completely change his identity live as his brother or play the long game and stay loyal to Team Green. But I guess that would have uh, altered the books way too much or something. I don't know. Um, anyway, so then this is a nice scene between Allison and her father. She actually calms him down, tells Otto to get the Tyrells back on board with them. And then Aegon will give him the position of the hand again once he cools down a bit. You know, and this scene just goes to show that Otto is actually respecting his daughter more now. He, he actually respects her opinion. You know, a little bit of character growth here from Otto here. That's, that's good to see. And in this moment of trust, she's even about to tell him 
her sin, you know? She feels like she sinned because she was sleeping with Kristen, I guess. But Otto doesn't want to hear it. He's I just not know. Which illustrates the hypocrisy in the Green faction. They're all about order and piousness. But in reality, they're committing these sins in the background and they don't even speak about it. Similar to conservatives in real life, the showrunners have said that they wanted to model the Greens to be like conservative politicians and rulers in real life. And Allison seems to have some trouble here connecting with her son. You know, she sees him crying. This is the moment where we do see some of that range that I was talking about where Aegon is not just a typical angry bro king. She's very much attached from him and this one moment where she could conceivably connect with him it's just it's just too much for her she rejects it she she leaves i guess she would rather be in the embrace of Kristen, with the slapping and the rough sex that comes along with it this anger and disgust for Kristen seems to work for her in bed works for him too i guess because they like to keep the depravity behind closed doors while criticizing team black for being so depraved you know all four political points yeah it's an okay episode they all can't be blood and cheese levels of disturbing but i'm still on board on this dragon of a show i'll see you next time under the moonlight bye bye